Good morning, good afternoon, or bonsoir, depending on from where you're joining us. My name is Rick Norris, and I'm a programmer for the Roxy Theater in San Francisco. You've tuned in to a live panel discussion for the film Downstream to Kinshasa. The Roxy has been temporarily closed to the public for over a year, but we're still committed to sharing great works of art in the virtual space, and that includes the exceptional documentary feature Downstream to Kinshasa, which we had the honor of opening yesterday on the Roxy Virtual Cinema, where the film will be available to stream for at least two weeks. If you have not yet seen it, I beseech you to do so by logging on to roxy.com. That's R-O-X-I-E.com. Now it's my delight to introduce our panelists today. Film director Yudo Hamadi was born in uh, Kisangani in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 1984. He studied medicine from 2005 to 2008. He then attended several documentary workshops. Judo is director of two short documentaries, Ladies in Waiting and Zero Tolerance that caught the attention of several festivals in Europe and Canada. Ladies in Waiting received the Pierre Nyolanda Parole Scholarship at Cinema du Real in 2009. He then directed four feature-length documentaries that gave him worldwide recognition, Atalaku in 2013, National Diploma in 2014, Mama Colonel in 2017, and Kinshasa Makambo in 2018. In 2019, Hamadi was awarded the Macmillan Stewart Fellowship in Distinguished Filmmaking by the Film Study Center at Harvard University. Today, he's joining us from Brussels. Guido, it's an honor to be showing your film, and thank you so much for being here. Merci d'être venu. Maurice Carney is a co-founder and executive director of uh, the Friends of Congo. He has worked with Congolese for over 15 years in their struggle for peace, justice, and human dignity. Mr. Carney possesses two bachelor degrees, a master degree, and is pursuing a PhD in political science. He has worked with uh, civic associations in West Africa, providing training on research methodology and survey. He has served as interim African working group coordinator for the Reverend Jesse Jackson while he was special envoy to Africa. Mr. Carney has worked as a research analyst for the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies and a research consultant for the Congressional Black Caucus. He's provided analysis on the Congo for Al Jazeera, ABC News, Democracy Now!, Real News Network, Pambazuka News, All Africa News, and a host of other outlets. Thank you so much for joining us today, Maurice. My pleasure. Our moderator today, Maudi Mukenge, brings over 21 years of programming and grant management and communications experience in the field of international philanthropy and development, women's rights, and global health. Originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo, she's uh, active in African uh, diaspora and international human rights initiatives, speaking often on issues of social movements, economic and political empowerment, and ending violence against women. Currently, Mukenge leads strategic direction for fundraising, partnership development, and global communications at IPASS, a global reproductive rights NGO. Previously, Mukenge oversaw grant making, special initiatives, and resource mobilization for Sub Sierra Africa for the Global Fund for Women from 2004 to 2016, growing its work most significantly in rural communities, conflict regions, and Francophone Africa. Mukenge grew GFW's portfolio in Great Lakes region, making frequent site visits and also organizing workshops and conferences. From 2014 to 2016, she managed a partnership with Global Fund for Women and the Office of the United Nations Special Envoy for the Great Lakes to include women in peace processes in the region. Mukenge has traveled to and worked with NGOs and partners in over 20 African countries. In her free time, she helps manage an education and develop initiative in rural Congo called Coins of Hope. Mukenge serves on the board of Priority African Network, the Congolese Studies Association, and Eastern Congo Initiative, 
and is a former board member of the African Studies Association and New Field Foundation. Maudie, it is an honor to have you conduct the conversation today. Thank you so much, Rick, and thank you so much for this invitation to hold this conversation, such an important conversation. Welcome to our audience. Many of you know that the Congo has been the scene of a protracted war for over 25 years, which involves multiple nations and which has resulted in the deaths of over 6 million Congolese. This war, as you know, is closely connected to the struggle for access to the vast mineral resources of the Congo which are critical to the global economy. And the war also stems from the jockeying for political control of the country. We know that peace accords have been signed. We had a post-war government, which rather than building up the country, continued to plunder state resources and neglect the population of over 85 million people. We held elections in 2018, and we continue to hope for a meaningful transformation that will lead to strong to strong public institutions in the Congo and sustain peace. We thank the Roxy Theater for partnering with Priority Africa Network to host today's talk. Pan's mission is to advance social justice and human rights for the peoples of Africa and peoples of African descent around the world. And we thank our board member, Cornelius Moore, who brought this collaboration to us. So today we have the opportunity to shine a light on everyday people who through no fault of their own, lost limbs, mobility, family members, and livelihoods during a six day war in 2000. And this is just a segment of the 25 years war that have been endured by the Congolese people. We've all read reports of these wars, but this film allows us to see things from a deeper perspective. We're here with the filmmaker, Jedo Hamadi, and we're here to talk about his journey making the film. And we will also have contributions and some analysis from advocacy group Friends of Congo, represented by Maurice Carney. Diego will respond in French, and so I'll be summarizing his responses into English. Diego, we'll start with you. You were born in Kinsangani, the site of the war where this film is based and the community that you're talking about in, in the film. And you were present actually during the Six Day War when forces from Rwanda and Uganda fought each other on Congolese soil. How did your personal experience play a role in deciding to make this film? Merci, merci Mwadi pour la question. Um, C'est vrai que je, je suis uh, uh, natif de Kisangani, uh, j'ai connu uh, Euh, cette guerre de ces jours, j'avais euh, entre 15 ans et 16 ans à l'époque. Euh, ce qui m'a aujourd'hui amené à faire ce film, plus ou moins 20 ans plus tard, c'est euh, les sentiments euh, que, nous, euh, que la mémoire aujourd'hui est effacée. Je me suis rendu compte euh, que collectivement, au Congo, nous avons déjà oublié ces drames. Euh, et, et en, étant devenu moi-même cinéaste, je me suis dit que c'est peut-être urgent euh, de remettre euh, cette histoire sous la table parce que ce qui s'est passé ne doit pas être oublié. Thank you so much. It's so poignant. Um, as someone who saw the war when you were about 15 or 16 years old, and um, your recognition that people have forgotten the war. Even in Congo, you feel that people have forgotten this war and that as a filmmaker, you feel this obligation to make people remember. It's so important. And, and so thank you for that, what brought you to make this film. Now, the association that is highlighted in the film, Association of Victims of the Six Day War in Kisangani, that's her formal name. I viewed the film and we see that the association is made up of people with disabilities. They go about their advocacy, traveling long distances, maneuvering on paved roads, on crutches, on canes. How did you meet them? How did you meet this association? How comfortable were they being filmed for this major produ production? Euh, merci pour la question. J'ai euh, rencontré pour la première fois cette association en 
2016 à Kisangani. J'étais sur le tournage d'un précédent film qui s'appelle Maman Colonel. Et je les ai rencontrés, euh, tous ces gens, euh, au bureau de cette femme de police qui, qui luttait contre les violences faites aux femmes et aux enfants. J'étais très choqué par euh, leur état physique parce que c'était de, des handicapés. Et lorsque j'ai compris que c'était aussi des victimes de la guerre des six jours, j'avais ces sentiments de honte, justement, en me disant euh, que nous autres, nous avons pu oublier cette guerre parce que nous avons été épargnés physiquement. Tandis que tous ces gens-là ne pouvaient pas oublier euh, la guerre des six jours parce qu'ils portaient les stigmates de cette guerre dans leur chair. Et à ce moment-là, j'ai décidé, en 2016, de, de monter un projet pour faire ce film avec eux. Donc, j'ai gardé contact euh, avec eux pendant tout ce temps jusqu'à ce que j'apprenne leur projet de, de voyage et que je vienne ensuite le, le, le trouver pour qu'on fasse le voyage ensemble. Such a poignant, poignant experience. You met the group in 2016 and um, you were filming another film. You were filming another film and you happened to be at the police station where you were highlighting a project that was supporting women, women uh, victims of violence, of sexual violence. And this group was there, this association of people with disabilities. And you were just such, you were so struck by their physical experience and, and appearance, but also just thinking that the rest of us had forgotten or could afford to forget what had happened so many years ago. But these people live with the memory every single day. Their, their physical, uh, status really has them remembering what happened to them every single day and so you were feeling really obligated to bring this film to the public and um, it came together once you learned that they were actually planning to take this trip to the capital city and so that's that's quite um, poignant so by the time you make this film group members have been trying to claim justice for 18 years you do a close-up of their daily routines the challenges they face with mobility this film um, shows how they're maintaining their prosthetics. But in, in, in the meantime, they're really fighting to be independent and they're trying to be accepted in their families. So we thank you for really humanizing the numbers that we often hear about. We hear the thousands and millions of people brutalized in the Congo. And as Congolese, we often ask ourselves, why is the rest of the world not reacting to the fact that more than 6 million people have died during this genocide? a genocide that involves not only armed groups, but neighboring countries and Western governments. Has this strategy of offering a close-up of your characters impacted non-Congolese audiences in a particular way? Um, pour moi, au départ, um, c'était uh, l'envie d'aller au-delà des apparences, tout simplement. Quand j'ai rencontré ces gens, euh, au bout de trois jours, j'oubliais presque qu'ils étaient des handicapés. Euh, tout simplement parce que euh, leur envie de vivre, leur humanité, leur dignité, prenait euh, très vite les dessus sur leur handicap. Et en faisant le film avec eux, j'avais envie de, de transmettre cela aux spectateurs, de montrer qu'il qu ne s'agissait pas de des victimes tout simplement ou des, des éclopés ou des handicapés. C'était des êtres humains en quête de dignité et cela était assez beau à voir. Et, et la, la seule façon de le montrer, c'était d'être au quotidien avec eux, plus proche d'eux et vivre la même expérience euh, qu'ils qu vivaient. Et c'est là, c'est imposé de soi. Et c'est tant mieux si... Euh, Uh, de, de spectateurs non congolais peuvent être touchés uh, par leur histoire à travers ce film. Thank you, thank you. You say that you wanted to go above their physical appearance, that this association uh, really uh, made you forget that uh, they had disabilities in the fact that they were so clear about their stress, their, um, their um, quest for dignity and the way that they also desire to live a dignified life. You wanted to share their dignity with the rest of the world, with your audiences. And you wanted to particularly convey that they're not victims, 
they're not victims, they're survivors. And what you did is to spend time with them on a regular basis daily. And that way you could live their experiences. And so when you learned that they were going to take this trip to Kinshasa, you decided to join them. Thank you. Now, Maurice, can you tell us a bit about the mission of Friends of the Congo? And what have been perhaps two of the most significant strategies your organization has implemented to amplify the struggle of the Congolese people? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Mwadi. Uh, Friends of the Congo has uh, been exist in existence uh, for almost two decades now uh, with two overarching aims. Uh, one is to raise global consciousness about what's transpiring in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And the second is to provide support to local institutions that are striving to, to achieve uh, justice and peace uh, in the country. Uh, two strategies, uh, concrete strategies that we've utilized in order to advance our mission is uh, one is establishment of what we call Congo Week. Congo Week is a global awareness campaign that takes place in the third week of each October uh, where uh, people throughout the globe do something in order to raise awareness around the Congo and elevate the profile of the of the Congo. They show films, uh, host teachings, have rallies, uh, just a host of activities that uh, people hold uh, to recognize the Congo and to make their communities, their local communities, aware of what's transpiring in the country. We've had over 75 countries and uh, 600 institutions participate. And a centerpiece of uh, Congo Week is a film festival that we host in New York. Uh, called Congo in Harlem, where we invite Congolese filmmakers to come and showcase uh, the work uh, that they've done in an effort to uh, humanize uh, what's unfolded, what has unfolded in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, so when people who are who'd more like to know more about Congo Week, they can go to a website where all our programs are archived and they can join up to participate. And that's at congoweek.org, congoweek.org. And that takes place the third week of each uh, of each uh, October. A uh, second strategy uh, that we utilize is a follow-up to Congo Week. We have what we call Breaking the Silence Speakers Tour, uh, which uh, kicks off uh, February 1st uh, each year. That is uh, Black History Month, uh, uh, the birthday of Langston Hughes, who was a huge uh, proponent of the Congo through his poetry. And uh, Breaking the Silence Speakers Tour runs right through to July 2nd. And July 2nd is a symbolic date uh, because that's the birthday of Patrice Lumumba, uh, who was uh, Congo's first democratically uh, elected prime minister. Uh, so between, uh, uh, from February to July, we tour the United States, Canada, Latin America, uh, Europe, sometimes Africa, to go in depth uh, with teachings in local communities and church basements and the university campuses uh, cinemas, museums, uh, to educate people about what's unfolding in the Congo and provide them with an opportunity to join the movement uh, for peace, justice, and human dignity in the country. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I've had the pleasure over the years to collaborate with Friends of the Congo, particularly when I was in the Bay Area. And so I, really, I really appreciate the importance of the work that you do here in the U.S. and, and across the world. Thank you. So, can you share very briefly, just describe for us the political context around the battle between Uganda and Rwanda, which took place in Congo around 2000. And, you know, instead of on their own soil, why was this happening on Congolese soil? Yeah, I, I think this uh, six day war, uh, which uh, is so emblematic, which Friends of the Congo commemorates and educate the, the global community around through our blog post uh, every year, we, we do not cease uh, to remind people about the Six Day War because it's so emblematic of what has unfolded in the Congo in the past two decades. And that is to say, uh, the Congo has been a victim of a war of aggression, a war of aggression by its neighbors, Rwanda and U Rwanda led by President Paul Kagame and Uganda led by President Yari Museveni. And both these governments are allies of the United States and they receive the backing of the United States in terms of financing, in terms of military equipment, in terms of intelligence, in terms of uh, a whole range of, uh, of support, including 
uh, the United States running interference at the international level and providing diplomatic and political cover for the crimes that these uh, leaders and their the armies have committed in the, in the Congo. So the fact that they went to Rwanda, the army of Rwanda and Uganda, armies of Rwanda and Uganda fought each other on Congolese soil, really encapsulate uh, the external nature of the conflict in the Congo. That is a conflict that was imposed upon the Congolese people to the point where these two nations went to battle against each other in order to control resources in the country. They were fighting over natural resources in the country. And, then, and as they were fighting over natural resources, we see that the victims of this external, of this external, uh, externally imposed uh, war were the Congolese people themselves. So it's so critical, uh, this Six Day War, because it frames that, uh, the, the nature of this conflict, that uh, the United Nations says the deadliest conflict in the world since World War II. And it's one that has been imposed on the Congolese people, not only by these two nations, but also by the fact that they've supported proxy groups in the Congo uh, for the last two decades that continue to destabilize entire swaths of Eastern Congo. So the Six Day War is, is very critical as a uh, introduction and explainer uh, to why the Congo is in perpetual conflict, uh, has been in perpetual conflict for the past two decades. Thank you so much for explaining that for our audience. And I want to turn now to Diojo because the way you tell the story in the film is, is quite interesting, it's, it's quite creative. How, can, how did you choose the format of the film? So what I noticed is that part of it was you following the association and their daily activities and then their advocacy for justice. And then you created some scenes similar to live theater. So can you tell us about that process and why it worked for you to convey the sentiment you wanted to communicate? Euh, merci pour la question. Euh, généralement, euh, je, je filme euh, de manière euh, directe euh, les gens dans mes documentaires. Je fais ce qu'on appelle le cinéma direct. Je, je m'introduis dans les quotidiens des gens et, et j'essaye de suivre euh, au jour le jour euh, leurs quêtes et leurs leur problèmes. Dans les cas de cette association, J'étais euh, assez euh, euh, attiré par euh, un aspect de leur activité qui consistait à faire de la représentation scénique. En fait, dans l'association, il y a une troupe de théâtre qui s'appelle les Zombies de Kisangani. Et chaque samedi, euh, quelques membres de l'association euh, faisaient des sketchs dans un centre culturel où ils racontaient plus ou moins... Euh, leur, leur propre histoire euh, qu'ils tournaient en dérision. Euh, J'ai trouvé euh, cela très, euh, très intéressant euh, parce que il y avait une différence entre leur quotidien de survivants de guerre et, et leur euh, représentation scénique. Sur scène, c'était des gens euh, différents qui s'appropriaient la parole et qui racontaient leur histoire avec leurs propres mots et de leur propre manière. Et c'est ainsi que j'ai voulu avoir le désaspect de leur vie dans le film. Au montage, on a essayé de mixer les deux pour, pour faire le film que vous avez pu voir. Thank you for that explanation. It's, it's so rich. And so I'm learning for the first time that this association actually has a theater group. And they perform every Saturday. They perform every Saturday at the Cultural Center in Kisangani to tell their own stories. Um, but you know, in, in your own experience, you usually use a methodology of following uh, the subjects of your films in such a way that people get a deeper sense of who they are and, and you're able to follow their daily activities. And so you combine these two um, strategies, these, these two ways of working, you know, following uh, your, your uh, subjects in, in their everyday lives and then weaving in the theater that the Association of Victims of the War produced themselves every day. And so what you saw was just um, you know, some uh, 
how do you say, different perspectives that were shared in each way of, of uh, showing their reality, whether it was in theater or also in following them every day, you're, also, you're able to see different sides of their reality. And this is something you wanted to share with us. That, that's so rich, that's so rich. Now, you donate, there are some very powerful scenes in the film. This, this, the stage scene, for example, where the group leader describes the atrocities that happened during the Six Day War. And also as you're following the group on their trip towards the capital from Kisangani to Kinshasa, we see the conditions on this overcrowded boat. The group also, when they arrive in Kinshasa and they're attempting to meet the members of parliament and in their frustration as members of parliament are passing them by, um, you know, and the members of the group are saying, what did I do to deserve this in terms of their physical handicap and the um, physical impact of the war as, as these very expensively dressed MPs pass by them. And also as they go to the United Nations, they took their advocacy to the United Nations in Kinshasa demanding attention. When refused, they, when refused, they asked, well, why are you here if you can't help us? We, there's a scene where they're writing their letter of their member of parliament by hand, very painstakingly, writing a letter by hand to their member of parliament. And so if one tactic didn't work, they tried another. So Diodo, how important was it for you to show the determination of the group members? Uh, je, je pense que c'est le plus important pour moi, c'était de montrer un peu de manière métaphorique, uh, c'est que c'est le peuple congolais aujourd'hui, uh, de manière générale. À travers uh, cette association, je racontais un peu l'histoire de tout le peuple congolais. Uh, c'est uh, un peuple uh, martyrisé pendant des années, uh, soumis à des situations extrêmes, à des situations politiques uh, extrêmes, uh, depuis l'indépendance, depuis 60 ans. Mais pour autant, ça reste toujours un peuple assez euh, digne qui, qui trouve toujours le moyen dans tous ces désastres pour euh, continuer d'avancer, pour continuer d'espérer à, à des lendemains meilleurs et à se battre pour cette quête. Je trouve cela très beau parce que euh, le, le, la fatalité, c'est de, de renoncer, de se dire qu'il n'y a plus d'espoir, que tout est perdu, euh, qu'il n'y a plus rien à faire. Les Congolais n'ont jamais dit cela, Ils ne pensent pas que tout est fini. Ils continuent malgré tout à espérer que, quoi qu'il arrive, quoi qu'il en soit, euh, c'est encore possible que quelque chose puisse changer. Et ces groupes euh, les traduisaient très bien. Et j'avais besoin, d'une certaine manière, de rendre hommage à tout le, le peuple congolais à travers ce courage que nous voyons dans, à travers ce groupe-là. Donc, euh, voilà, c'est une métaphore de, de l'état d'esprit des Congolais que, que je trouve euh, assez beau, de ne jamais désespérer, de continuer à se battre, même quand les combats semblent être perdus d'avance. Thank you, thank you. And you said that this was one of the most important things that you wanted to show in the film, the, the determination of Congolese people. It's, it's um, you know, you, the, the way that you showed the, the stories of this particular group, the members of the group, is really a way to show the stories of all Congolese and also to tell the story of what Congolese have been living since independence. Uh, you know, we can, and we can all be very despondent or, you know, people are not having a fatalistic attitude in terms of all the negative things that have been happening and all the trauma. Rather, people are quite hopeful. People keep that hope, they keep that dignity, they keep the fight for dignity. And so this is something you wanted to convey in the film, um, you wanted to show this attitude that all is not lost. And that the Congolese people always are keeping the hope at the front of, of their minds and they are always pushing for something to change. And so you felt that the association of uh, disabled people actually you know, demonstrated this, this uh, characteristic extremely well. And in a way this film pays uh, homage to and honors all Congolese people by showing their determination and, and their hope. Maurice, as you viewed the film, now very briefly tell us which parts of the film stood out the most to you. Wow. You just have to pick one. One. <laughs> just one. <laughs> well, really, I'll pick the one that's emblematic of uh, almost all of Diodo's uh, films. 
and that is the how he humanizes uh, the the pursuit for justice, how he humanizes the the people who've been victims of uh, heinous crimes. Uh, we saw the protagonists uh, battling not only to secure justice uh, and dignity from the state, uh, but from their own families, from their own communities. Uh, so I, I thought that was uh, extremely compelling, uh, the manner in which uh, Diego tapped into the personal while telling a, a global uh, uh, story. So you give me just one example. Oh, uh, yeah, sure, cer certainly. Uh, one, one example is uh, when they were on the, uh, on the, on the barge, on the way down to, to Kinshasa, uh, there was a, a, a debate between uh, the elder woman and one of the younger uh, men uh, where they, they were talking about how it is that uh, their family, they have to, to fight for, for, for dignity, uh, at, uh, even among their own families and their own communities. Uh, so in that dialogue, uh, they provided the audience uh, insight that uh, their fight wasn't just a fight for justice or overall, but it was a fight for recognition, a uh, fight for dignity, uh, a fight to uh, convince their family members and, uh, and members of their communities that they're not, their situation is not hopeless, uh, but they do have agency and they're willing, they're willing and able to exercise that agency. So that dialogue on the, on the barge on down towards Kinshasa uh, brought that out for me. You said a very important word, agency, and yes, that's yes. what comes across throughout the film. And we thank Diodo for really making that so, so clear. Some of you in the audience haven't seen the film yet. We really encourage you to watch the film. It's available for the next two weeks. And um, I think you'll be really touched and struck by all the actions that the group in the film takes in you know, what we call advocacy. You know, they, they stage sit-ins, they reach out to members of parliament, they do radio shows. And um, so I think it's a really fantastic story. Now, it's quite a coincidence, or this is a question for Diodo, it's quite a coincidence that there are press articles now, as, as we speak, about the case at the International Court of Justice against Uganda, DRC against Uganda, to pay compensation for the violence it perpetrated in Congo from 1996 to 2003. The compensation, um, which has been decreased over the years, now equals 5 billion, is what Congo is seeking. In the movie, the association says that they were promised 1 billion. And so they're, they're going to depose their claim at the uh, at parliament. What has happened after 18 years? Why are we not getting justice? Why, where is our compensation? Can you tell us what is the status of the group's claim today? You filmed in December, 2018, and it's been over two years now. Have they received anything? Euh, moi, je filmais euh, à partir de, de, de 2018, c'est vrai. Euh, et depuis, euh, il s'est passé deux ans. Mais leur combat, le combat de cette association a commencé depuis 20 ans. Mm -hmm. euh, ils sont, que ces membres de, la, de, de, de cette association euh, essayent de pousser euh, pour obtenir réparation euh, de la part de de l'Ouganda principalement parce que le Rwanda euh, n'est ne, pas poursuivi par la Cour internationale de justice. Et euh, aujourd'hui, le film a fait euh, beaucoup de bruit au Congo, notamment grâce à, à sa sélection officielle au Festival des Cannes de l'année dernière. C'était une première fois qu'un qu film congolais a été sélectionné à ces, à ces festivals. Et... Euh, Quelques, quelques victimes qui étaient encore sur place à Kinshasa à l'époque, donc l'année dernière, ont été approchées par le gouvernement et on leur a remis, euh, ils étaient à peu près 15, on leur a remis une somme d'argent importante, c'était au moins 3 000 dollars par chacun, euh, à titre de compensation, euh, je vais dire, euh, temporaire, comme, comme ils ont appelé. Et récemment, je viens d'apprendre euh, que le gouvernement a débloqué 500 000 dollars pour euh, euh, toutes les victimes qui étaient restées à Kinshasa, à Kisangani, environ 3 000 personnes. Et ils ont réussi chacun une, une somme d'argent, euh, euh, 
voilà, pour, pour les aider un peu. Et, et en ce moment, effectivement, il y a aussi euh, le procès entre le, Rwanda, le Congo et le Uganda qui a redémarré euh, à, la cour, à la Cour internationale de justice. Euh, je ne sais pas dans quelle mesure la, le film, euh, cela est lié à la sortie du film. Toujours est-il que depuis, que, depuis euh, l'année dernière, depuis que ce film a été euh, sélectionné à Cannes, euh, les choses ont semblé bouger euh, pour les victimes euh, à travers le pays. Thank you, thank you. I think it's so wonderful and um, it's good for our audience to know this, but it's been 20 years that this association has been fighting for justice and fighting for reparations from Uganda. And it's only Uganda because Rwanda actually is not a, a uh, defendant in the case against the international, I mean, brought at the level of the International Court of Justice. And so the, the film was, was filmed in, in 2018. But last year, uh, Ziodo, you won, you, you were nominated for a prize for, at the Cannes Film Festival, which is an incredible honor, an incredible honor. And at that time, some victims who were still in Kinshasa, who had continued their stay and were still in Kinshasa, were approached by members of government. Now imagine in the film, we show how they were ignored and completely rejected by these same Uh, officials, but last year they were approached and 15 people who were in that group received $3,000 $3, as a temporary amount of reparations. And recently what you're telling us is that the government released $500,000 for all victims who were in Kisangani. And so 3,000 people in Kisangani received a certain amount of money as partial reparations for what they had experienced and lived through and, and um, suffered in the 2006 day war. Now we see that the court case at the International Court of Justice has resumed. And I mean, you're not sure exactly why after all this time the, the case has gotten a little bit more momentum, but you're thinking perhaps the film helped to bring awareness and help to restart conversations. And you indicated that definitely in Congo, there have been a lot of conversations about this film. It, it has caused some, some excitement. And, and so that's wonderful for us to know. Now, um, Maurice, let's wrap up a bit because we want to see if the audience has any questions. We want to invite the audience, definitely put your questions in the chat and we'll be able to respond to them. Now, Maurice, what about justice? In addition to this court case at the ICJ, There are some war criminals that are being prosecuted at the International Criminal Court. How do we make accountability a reality at the national level as well? And so, I mean, many families don't have the resources to hire a lawyer. It's even harder for people with disabilities. And I know that the women's movement in Congo has played a strong role in defending, women's, in defending women who have experienced sexual violence during armed conflict. And there are many associations that I know and that are working really hard, particularly women lawyers who take testimonials from women, who file documents, who train judges also about the unique, the unique challenges facing women. And they try to also organize community courts, bringing the process directly into neighborhoods so that communities don't have to make that long trip to the capital as we see in this film. And these types of efforts need to be scaled up. So based on what you've seen, can you just point us maybe to two strategies to make the justice system actually work for those that have suffered from the protracted conflict in Congo? Even today in the Northeastern part of the Congo in the cities of Beni, Butembo, Goma, there are unspeakable atrocities taking place every single day. So how do we compel rapid action? And what do you see as the challenges of the Congolese government to actually establish control of the eastern part of the country and establish peace? Uh, a very easy point. question, right? Yes, yes, a few <laughs> points, uh, Wadi. Uh, first is that uh, uh, the International Court of Justice ruled in 2005 that Uganda uh, is indebted to the Congo for up to $10 billion dollars for the crime that was committed. That uh, was a, a critical one. It shows that international justice uh, working on one level. Uh, unfortunately, 
uh, Rwanda is not party to the International Court of Justice. And so they couldn't uh, be uh, charged for those crimes, but they are indebted to the Congolese people uh, to the extent, to the same extent that Uganda is. Uh, however, it, uh, the case demonstrates the exceptionalism that Rwanda holds when it comes to the crimes that it has committed in the Congo. It tends to slip away from that, that accountability. Uh, and uh, that's really important that we point that out. Now, Kisangani and the, the Six Day War is critical to one of the major studies that was done by the United Nations, the United Nations Map and Exercise Report, which documented atrocities in the Congo uh, from 1993 to 2003. Uh, that's a, a critical report that uh, many people had to advocate to actually get it published uh, in 2010. Uh, the, the initial report was leaked uh, because uh, there was resistance on the part of countries like Rwanda, the United States, to expose uh, in plain and clear detail uh, not only the crimes that were committed in the Congo, but the perpetrators. Uh, by the grace, uh, we've seen that uh, this mapping report and the pursuit to get the, the recommendations in the report implemented, which calls for an international tribunal on the Congo, which calls for reparations to the Congolese people, is being taken up uh, by a Nobel Peace Prize laureate from the Congo, Dr. Dennis Benny Mukwege. And he's championing the cause for justice for the Congolese people. And that includes justice for the people in Kisangani and in Benin and other parts of the East. So if there is one thing that I would encourage people to do in order to support this effort uh, to bring about justice in the Congo would be to support Dr. Mkwegwe's undertaking uh, in his pursuit for getting an international tribunal established in the Congo and getting the uh, United Nations Mapping Exercise uh, Report recommendations implemented. And one website I would recommend for them to go would be to COPAX, uh, K-O-P-A-X. KOPAX.org, if they would like to join Dr. Mukwege uh, in this in this quest. Uh, so that's that's uh, the first part. It's really critical uh, that people understand that what I'm following in Kisangani is part of a, a larger context of the pursuit for justice uh, in the Congo, and it's being taken up by uh, one of uh, the world's most renowned uh, surgeon, uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Dr. Uh, Denny Mukwege. Now, the president of the Congo, Felix Chesikedi, when he was running for office, he said that he was going to, he was going to uh, camp out in the east of the country until peace and stability arrives. And he hasn't fulfilled on that promise yet. So one of the things that needs to happen is for us to hold him accountable, for him to uh, fulfill on the promise that, that he made. A uh, big challenge has been uh, the Congolese state has not been able to exercise authority over its uh, regions in the east. And it's vital for the state to, 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 to be able to do that. And it's critical uh, that we call on uh, the President Chisikedi uh, to uh, fulfill on his promise and taking steps to bring about peace and stability in each of the country. And also, he's the head of the African Union uh, for this year. Uh, so uh, he needs to uh, enroll the African Union in uh, bringing about uh, peace and stability in the east of the Congo and bringing about justice for the Congolese people. Uh, so we think a lot uh, is on the shoulders of the, of the current president, and especially considering the promises that he's made, and that uh, we should take this opportunity uh, to uh, remind him of those promises and hold him to account uh, for the challenges that we still see in the East of the East of the Congo. That's all right, that's all right. And these reminders come from all of these voices around the world and from various movements who continue to tell the story and who continue to push for justice. We need all of the actors that are being vocal on human rights in Congo. And um, you know, advocacy is about being persistent. It's about continuing to be persistent, you know, even when you have a, a wall in front of you. And so that leads me to a question for you, Diodo, which comes from the chat. If you can describe a little bit the experience of filming at Parliament when the association members were on the steps of the Capitol trying to get in 
and the soldiers are there preventing them from getting in. The association, association members there are holding their signs, they're shouting phrases, they're shouting for their rights and trying to be heard. Were you feeling fearful? How did you deal with the pressure that what's happening as you were filming that particular scene on the steps of parliament? J'espère que vous avez bien saisi la question. Uh, oui, oui, uh, uh, plus, plus ou moins. Uh, uh, L'idée uh, de départ était, uh, était simple et claire pour moi, c'est que j'étais du côté de ces victimes. Quoi qu'il arrive, quoi qu'il se passe, uh, je devais être, montrer leur point de vue, montrer ce qu'ils voyaient et montrer ce qu'ils vivaient. À partir de ce moment-là, la brutalité... Uh, dont ils étaient victimes, euh, je devais plus ou moins la subir aussi. Et euh, le, le Parlement, c'est une institution importante à Kinshasa, euh, quadrillée par beaucoup de, 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 de éléments de police. Je m'attendais plus ou moins un peu à ce que les choses soient, euh, soient difficiles. Mais toujours est-il que sur le moment, le, le, le premier réflexe pour moi, c'était de filmer, de continuer à filmer quoi qu'il arrive, parce que c'était la seule façon de témoigner euh, de, du combat de ces, de, ces, de ces gens que je, je filmais, que je, je suivais. Et, et donc, euh, ça, ça devenait plus ou moins un réflexe que de, de continuer à filmer malgré tout, même quand c'était pratiquement impossible. Thank you, thank you. And uh, you've shared that you had a commitment to tell the group story, no matter what happened, no matter how difficult it was going to be, that you were going to be there with them and tell their story. And you wanted to show what they actually lived through. And um, so when they're at Parliament, surrounded, you know, an entity that's surrounded by a lot of security, you, you knew that you would anticipate a lot of security, a lot of police, and you anticipated that it would be a very difficult day, a very difficult experience, but you were determined to film no matter what. And it was the only way that you saw that you could actually tell the story if you endured, no matter the attempts of the police to shut you down and to take your camera that went ahead and filmed. And you saw that, you saw that in the, in the, uh, in the movie. As, can you also tell us about any upcoming projects that you have? Are there new films that you're working on? What can we look forward to? Euh, alors, maintenant, je essaye de, de faire autre chose. Ça fait pratiquement euh, 13 ans que je travaille sur le, euh, le quotidien de Congolais, euh, sur les problèmes urgents dans notre société. Et j'ai besoin de prendre un peu de recul, de euh, visiter d'autres pans de notre histoire. Et, et j'aimerais faire pour cela de la fiction. Uh, et, et voir dans quelle mesure je vais apprendre un peu plus sur, uh, uh, sur ce que nous sommes, sur, uh, sur notre, notre identité, sur notre société. Parce que pour moi, le cinéma sert à cela. Pour moi, si le cinéma sert à quelque chose, c'est uh, découvrir soi-même et aussi uh, interroger ses origines et son passé et son futur. Donc, je vais un peu prendre la distance avec le quotidien chaotique des Congolais pour m'intéresser à d'autres aspects de notre, de notre société en faisant des films de fiction. Et en ce moment, je prépare un premier long métrage de fiction plus une série pour la télévision. OK, all right. This is very exciting, very exciting. So you said that you have, you have been committed to showing the lives of everyday Congolese for 13 years. That's what your films have been sharing for, for some time. But now you you are working on some new projects, and you want to able to you want to be able to show other aspects of uh, Congolese realities and um, and identities, and so you're looking at developing some fiction, and so we're looking forward to to see what comes next from you. You talked about a a fiction film, but also a television series, and so we'll we'll really be um, looking forward to those works of art. You, you said that. You know, you have uh, an interest in really looking at self-discovery, questions of self-discovery, also really questioning our past as Congolese and, and our future. 
and you will be integrating these themes into your new project. And so we're, we're very excited to, to, um, to anticipate that. Now for our audience, we'd like for you to support the film downstream to Kinshasa. Go to the Roxy Theater website to watch it, roxy.com backslash down, downstream dash two dash Kinshasa. It will run until May 6th. We want you to share it with your networks and friends and advocacy circles. It's an important piece of work and it's important to promote this work as well because we need more films and, narr and narratives that are told by Africans. And in this case, a Congolese filmmaker sharing this very powerful story. Please also visit the Priority Africa Network website at www.priorityafrica.org to see what we are doing in the Bay Area and beyond. Personally, I am very, very inspired by the members of the Association of Victims of the Six Day War in Kinsangani as portrayed in the movie. I would use the word survivors. They are certainly survivors. I, I don't see them as victims, but the, they are survivors. And their relentless spirit to claim their dignity. Now, before we wrap up, let me just ask our filmmaker, Monsieur Diodo, can you Maybe do you have a last statement that you'd like to make about this film or about what impact that you hope that it will have? You've, you've um, had some coverage in the New York Times and the, the Congolese story is getting into very mainstream and, and prominent spaces. What would the last message you want to convey in this particular conversation today? Um, je suis uh, très, uh, très content. Uh, d'avoir participé à cette à ces Q&A, de retrouver Maurice Carnet que je connais de longue date, c'est quelqu'un qui qui m'a soutenu sur un projet précédent qui soutient beaucoup de Congolais. C'est ce qu'ils font. Je me suis beaucoup appuyé sur lui pour tourner Kinshasa Makambo il y a quelques années. Et je suis très content de le retrouver là et de parler avec lui toujours avec passion du Congo. Je pense que ce qui se passe autour de ce film est déjà bien au-delà de, de mes espérances de départ. Parce que pour moi, c'était simplement le, le plus important, c'était euh, d'utiliser mon métier pour euh, entretenir la mémoire. Parce que c'est très important que nous ne puissions pas oublier euh, tout ce qui, qui s'est passé, euh, au risque de, de, de voir tous ces drames se reproduire. Et moi, je l'ai fait, euh, peut-être pas forcément pour le Congolais aujourd'hui, même pour les Congolais futurs, il ne faut pas, pas qu'ils oublient ce qui nous est arrivé. Parce que un des fléaux dans la société congolaise aujourd'hui, c'est l'amnésie, c'est l'oubli, c'est les trous de mémoire. Et, et je pense que le cinéma est un médium puissant pour lutter contre cela. Mais quand je vois euh, tout, toute la reconnaissance que le film euh, rencontre, euh, à, à, de, de par le monde, le prix et les couvertures médiatiques et tout. Voilà, c est, c est, c est, je suis plutôt reconnaissant, je suis très, euh, très heureux. Euh, ça veut simplement dire que notre travail n'est pas vain et que, et que cela va aider à ce que le film puisse être vu par beaucoup de gens, y compris les Américains, parce qu'on ne doit pas oublier que Uh, les États-Unis sont un des pays les plus influents, non seulement au monde, mais plus particulièrement au Congo. Uh, durant ces dernières années, ces 50 dernières années, uh, la politique américaine uh, a influé de manière déterminante uh, uh, l'histoire du Congo. Donc, si à travers ce film et d'autres, uh, des Américains peuvent prendre conscience de ce que nous vivons, et c'est que la politique américaine euh, peut euh, créer en bien ou en mal dans notre pays. Euh, en tant que cinéaste, c'est déjà quelque chose de, de, de grand que j'aurais accompli. Donc, merci encore à Roxy et à tout le monde de m'avoir invité et d'avoir partagé euh, ce film avec vous. Thank you so much, Diodo. I want to translate for our audience. In general, you're extremely happy to see the attention that the film has brought about. 
and um, you thank also the panel for for you know having an opportunity to talk about this film. And you've known Maurice for years. You guys have actually worked on a project together. And uh, I didn't know that when I was trying to look for a speaker, but you know, the universe brought us together. And so um, you said that this film project has actually surpassed your expectations. And that you wanted to make sure that you use your tool and your tools and your skill set to relive memory. And you wanted to make sure that this story, that this war and the trauma would not repeat itself. It's important to tell the story so that we risk not repeating it. And you wanted this to be shown not only to Congolese, but of the Congolese of today, but the Congolese of tomorrow, that we have this piece of work that tells the uh, history. And you are pleased with the attention that has happened through media, through the prize, and it feels to you that this project was not in vain. And, and we want to reassure you that we agree with you. It's definitely not in, in vain. And the attention to the film helps raise the issue of, of the, the violence in Congo and the human rights violations. It helps to raise this issue in, in public. Now, you, you're particularly interested in raising awareness in the American public so that the American society can raise its consciousness about the role of the U.S. in the Congo, particularly over the last 50 years, where it has had a very determining role in the politics of, of Congo and the, um, the reality that we're living today in terms of the politics and in terms of political economy and the armed conflict. And so the American public needs to deepen its understanding of the, the, um, the role of American foreign policy in, in the Congo. And we hope that, that there will be a more thoughtful and informed uh, part that the American public can, can take um, in, into the future. Maurice, we also want to, to thank you for joining us in this conversation and providing such important analysis. And we hope that we have an opportunity to work with both of you on other pieces of, um, of work and, and initiatives and, and advocacy about the Congo and, and other places around the continent. And again, we thank Roxy Theater and we thank Priority Africa Network in particular for this collaboration. My name is Mwadi Bukenge and thank you so much for this conversation. The audience will have an opportunity to see this event and see this conversation. It's, going to, it's being recorded and it's going to be available on YouTube and very soon we'll be able to post it for you. But please go to the website of theroxy.com and see the film if you haven't seen it already. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Dodo. À la prochaine.